This is, you know, this is kind of the reason I'm so into Elm, because there's like a network effect where the more Elm you write, the better the existing Elm code becomes. Hey, folks, welcome back to Elm Town. I'm your host, Jared M. Smith. We'll be visiting with Martin Stewart today. But first, let's talk about our sponsor, Logistically. At Logistically, we make intuitive software for the logistics industry to help logistics professionals make better decisions and spend less time on manual tasks. From quoting to tracking, our transportation management system helps squeeze every drop of efficiency from logistics teams of all sizes. I enjoy riding Elm at work. I do it nearly every day. Uh, I do full stack, but um, I, I enjoy it. So um, come check us out. Logistically pays me to record Elm Town episodes as well as pays for our production and hosting costs. We build the front end for all new features in Elm. If you're interested in our mission and enjoy writing Elm, please drop us a line, elmtown at logisticallyinc.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. Now, Martin. Martin is a prolific Elm developer. You might say he's all in with Elm using Lambda to build full stack Elm apps from games and side projects to a real estate startup. Some of his projects include ASCII Collab, an app for drawing ASCII art with other people, Circuit Breaker, Meet Down, it's a meetup alternative, awesome, State of Elm Survey 2022, uh, several packages, a couple of them I'll mention under Martin S. Stewart, is Elm Audio and Elm Serialize. He wrote at least the initial version of Lambda Program Test. He also developed the interactive UI source maps for Lambda and many, many more. Uh, he is an advocate for Elm. He presented Hobby Scale making web apps with minimal fuss at, was it Funk Prague, Sweden? Uh, Funk Prague, Sweden, and also at Goto Oris. Oh, wow. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Martin, welcome downtown. Thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really nice to be back. It was a while since I got to be on the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a few years. So we got to catch up. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to start with is to kind of go back and there was something that you mentioned and I usually go out and get a question from somebody you know and so I got a question from Thea, your sister. She says, quote, one project we worked on together was a cute little New Year's gift for our friend group recapping some of the fun conversations we had that year, end quote. So could you tell me a little bit more about that? I know you mentioned that on Elmtown 48. Uh, the last episode you were on, but uh, maybe you get a little bit more history behind that idea and how that all worked. Uh, well, hang on. So there's actually two um, cases where Thea and I made a little like New Year's present for my friends. So I'm not sure which one she's referring to. Um, but but in both cases, okay. the, she's right. We um, it was we like we found we collected a bunch of like silly quotes our friends had said over the past year and we uh drew pixel art versions of role play characters they had used and like because we like to run like dungeons and dragons type of role plays so we have little pixel art versions of those characters saying the things they wrote on discord over the past year and we would pair it up to some you know relaxing music or something um uh, as far as I can tell, everyone enjoyed it. Um, but the, this is not to be confused with the game I made for my sister, which uh, <laughs> which is yet another thing. That's what right. I talked about on the original Almtown. Right. Yeah, this is different. I think you had mentioned this just in sort of in passing. We hadn't really heard the, the details about it. So um, was this project written in Elm, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it, it's safe to assume, unless I say otherwise, it's an elm. It's, yeah, it's always yeah. an elm. <laughs> yeah, and so um, what was this an early project for you, as far uh, as like projects you've written with elm? Uh, to be clear, we're talking about the the uh, the thing I made for my friends' New Year's present. Yes, yes. Yeah, so that would have been uh, the the second one was two years ago. The first one was three years ago, I believe. Okay. So, so yeah, and I guess you started with Elm in 2018. So it, folks were kind of talking a little bit of history, repeating some stuff here, but just so you kind of know, um, and I'll 
kind of quickly go through this, Martin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, from what I understand, you started with Elm 2018 and then had kind of been using it on side projects, been working at a consultancy and, uh, you know, got a couple opportunities, one of which you got kind of to work on Circuit Breaker um, kind of on your, uh, during work hours uh, between clients, which is pretty awesome. That's a, an, an awesome game mm-hmm. as well. <laughs> um, and then like up to the point where you had the last episode, this would have been pre COVID 2020. So, you know, we were all like, you know, super happy folks in, in, in January. Yeah. We didn't know. We didn't know at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were unprepared. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so at that point then, um, it'd been a couple of years since you've been, uh, writing Elm and this project was a front end only, correct? Not full stack Lambda. That is correct. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So, um, yeah. So what was kind of this, this project that you decided to do in Elm? Was it because you were just giddy about Elm or was there something about it where you were like, okay. I'm going to think about different options and then I chose Elm because X, Y, and Z. The project that you built with your sister, Thea. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, that's what I like. I use what I enjoy and I enjoy Elm and I don't enjoy many other languages. So yeah, there isn't much to pick from. Uh, But which that, okay, that makes it sound like I like (laughs) wish I had more (laughs) options. Elm is, uh, as they say, delightful. So yeah, I use it because I enjoy it. Yeah, I mean that that makes sense. I I wouldn't expect any other thing. Um, <laughs> but but I guess kind of then moving on, you at, at the point of the last episode when you recorded with Kevin, had you discovered Lambda yet? That's a good question. I think the answer is no. If I remember the timeline correctly, Mario might have. I think Mario had given his talk about Evergreen Elm. So that's when he talked about how to handle migrating data from like N past versions of an app. But he had not taken that idea and built the rest of the Lambda framework around it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that seems to make sense from my listening back to that conversation. One of the things that you had mentioned was that you had been one of your first projects with Elm, if I recall correctly, was a, a Lego Loco remake, right? Where um, you had mentioned that yeah, yeah. one of the one of the challenges that you had with that was that your front end was in Elm, your back end was in C sharp, and you were recreating logic between those a functional language, an object oriented language, and and you know trying to make those two. Um, together and and work together was just something that, you know, you ended up saying, well, there are other things I can do that don't have this problem. And so you kind of moved on to other projects. Um, Do you have anything else to, yeah. Do you have anything else to say about that as far as like that, that project, any updates maybe or. (laughs) Yeah. So at the time, and let's see, that was like, I guess that was about three years no, 20, 23 now. So it must have been like four, four and a half years ago at this point. Um, yeah, I thought that was it because there was no good way to write Elm on the back end. So I was stuck using C Sharp. And yeah, trying to rewrite game logic code in, El- in Elm and in C Sharp, you know, not fun. And I want to do things that are fun. But <laughs> going forward to three years then, once like, I, I guess I heard about Lambda like, two years after that, maybe one year. I, again, time flies. It's hard to keep track exactly when things happen. But at some <laughs> point, I learned about Lambda. And um, the, the first things I did were much like much less ambitious. I made a app called The Best Color where people can just, you know, there's one globally defined color that if you go to the website and pick a different color, then that's the different color everyone sees. And then they can decide. They disagree and pick a different color. Anyway, that that was like the first, very first thing I made in Lambda. And there's a whole bunch of other things I made. You know, I made Meet Down. I made a couple other small things. Uh, well, I was working at a company called Insurel at the time, uh, and and some of the apps we use internally I didn't really like, so I made like Lambda replacements for those. But um, about 
about a year ago at this point, I decided, you know what? It's time to restart that uh, Lego re Lego Loco remake. Um, I decided to rename it to Town Collab uh, instead, but same game essentially, except now I was going to use Lambdera for it. Uh, I, I believe you had time to try it out. I don't know what your thoughts are on it. <laughs> yeah, I did get a chance to try that out. Now, I don't think you've uh, exactly announced this this project um, to the community, but um, I did ask for an invite and played around with it. Really enjoyed it. I was sitting uh, on the couch with my son next to me. He's playing Minecraft and I'm playing that and he's over, you know, pointing like, hey, that, that's <laughs> cool. What do, you, what do you think about that? So yeah, I was um, talking with him about it. Unfortunately, he usually plays on a tablet, so um, tablet yeah, is not supported that's... for for it. So um, not yet. So yeah, he yeah, I couldn't invite him yet, but um, but yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully that'll be a thing we can do in the future. Um, but yeah, I I really enjoyed it. Um, I guess to to talk about some of the different aspects of it that. I enjoyed. Um, one of them was that I could put things together that that made sense together. Like it was kind of like this, you know, when you think about Legos, right? Like things fit together. Like it was mm -hmm. clear <laughs> that all these these different parts would fit together, right? Like it wasn't a lot of effort to figure out, like, oh, okay, these things don't work. These things, you know, and you you're trying to a bunch of different things that just don't don't make sense together. So so that was nice. Um, I like the ability that I could customize colors on things. That was fun. Um, it took me a little bit to figure out that when you're at the train uh, house, the train house, where yep, you the train can house. where you can kind of uh, pop a train into existence, I tried to connect the track back into that train house, and it would always stop at the end of it and say, "Help, help." Um, so then I learned like, okay, the train house goes before, and then I put a split and then, you know, I can let the train keep on going around if it kind of enters into that track and then, um, and then keeps going around from the, the split. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that was something that, uh, <laughs> that it looked like I could connect, but when I did, then it was like it considered it a dead end. For our listeners, maybe I should give a quick summary of what Town Collab is. Uh, perhaps you can link it in the show notes as well. But the idea is it's a little town building game, like a top-down, two-dimensional perspective, uh, you know, like Legend of Zelda perspective. And you can place little houses. And crucially, it's multiplayer, so you can you can collaborate, Town Collab. Uh, you can collaborate building your town together. And there's there's railroads and there's post offices and you can send letters to each other with those post offices. I, I don't know if you found that feature. It's not the most... Uh, the, a tutorial is required for this game and it doesn't exist yet. But yeah, uh, I've heard a genre of game called the cozy games and I think this might fit that genre. Yeah, yeah, I think it, that makes sense. The The music is quite delightful calm but enjoyable and the train is not overbearing and i like that as the train starts to move off the screen the the volume gets lower as it you know sort of fades into the distance and then when it comes back it slowly fades back in so um that was quite a nice touch um and the collaboration is really cool i have not sent a message yet but I think that's that's really cool and just kind of looking around at what other people are building is a lot of fun. So I'm excited about it. One thing that I noticed was that it reminded me a lot of ASCII collab. I'm guessing that you must have gained some knowledge from that project that then you were able to build upon for this one. Yeah, there there is a connection. Uh, the name might suggest it as well, given they both have collab in the name. But actually, the the core code for running both games is the same. I essentially built Town Collab by just taking the ASCII Collab code and then making very large modifications to it. But the the core of it's the same. Like the the way it handles uh, undo, even with multi multiple people playing at the same time, it's the same code. Like the yeah, the, essentially the net code is the same. Um, from the beginning, basically, what I did was I 
because because ascii collab is just ascii so i have a texture with every possible ascii character and i just replace that texture with the pictures of houses instead uh to begin with and then built from there um nice. obviously there's some like departures from ascii collab like trains there's no trains in ascii collab maybe there should be but there isn't <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> Right, unless you design one yourself out of ASCII art. Well, okay. In that case, there is trains. Uh, at least there's <laughs> there are there are definitely railroads in ASCII collab. I think I drew some railroads. There, I think there's a train. It's been a while. I'm not sure. <laughs> nice. Okay, so yeah, I mean, even the original uh, the ASCII collab. I think there were a lot of really interesting challenges, like you briefly mentioned there where if you are dealing with multiple players real time interacting on the same surface, right? Like you have to deal with what happens when those things collide. And I know you mentioned this briefly, or I mean, you mentioned this in more detail in the past and we can link to those different resources, but could you maybe talk about that a little bit and how you solve that problem? Yeah. Um, I think the best analogy is a, if, if I refer to Git, it, it, if, you're, if you don't use Git, then this analogy is of no use. But for those who are, think of it as you have, a, you have the, the main branch and then you have your own feature branch. Those are the changes you're making to the canvas. Um, and then those changes get sent to the server and the server sends back confirmations that have got your change. And whenever that happens, think of that as like a, a rebase. It's taking your commit, placing it on the main branch, and then all your remaining features uh, on, on the uh, feature branch branch off from that new spot on the uh, commit history. And so if someone else makes a change, then you're now rebasing off of that, and you're replaying all, all your changes from the latest uh, uh, change from the server. Uh, hopefully that makes things clear. Otherwise, yeah. I have a better presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. And so you were able to reuse that core logic and I guess probably some of the features of how you log in, things like that. Um, yeah. So, okay, um, I like that. I like the simplicity of the login method too. Just here, what's your email? Here's a link. Um, yeah. Really nice. Okay, and so this was something that you came back to, what was it with Lambda that you felt like enabled you to do this? I'm assuming that, you know, that was the case because uh, before you discovered Lambda, this this project was shelved and now you came back to it and used Lambda to build it. Yeah. So as mentioned previously, the original version used C Sharp on the back end. Not ideal because now I have to rewrite the code for the game logic twice. But even hypothetically, like let's just suppose I had Elm on the back end. You know, I just, you know, I, it's not directly supported with an Elm, but you can always do a platform not worker, run some Elm code in the back, uh, in in the back end, and you know, some kind of, in in some kind of um, AWS microservice, something like that. That's something you could do. Um, I think even in a situation like that, I probably would not have had the motivation to do Town Collab because what that does not do and what Lambda does provide you is like handling all of the the message passing between the front end and back end, for instance. So like if I was writing my back end from scratch with no Lambda framework. I need to write an encoder and a decoder for the data that's going to be sent from the back end to the front end. Likewise, I need to do the same thing from the front end to the back end. Um, so that's already a lot of, you know, it's a lot of effort. And of course, now there, there are tools that have emerged that they can try to generate that for you, but they're usually not perfect. They're not, they're not as seamless compared to Lambda where, you know, you don't even need to think about it. It's just not a, a thing that needs to cross your mind. It just works in the background. And then there's other concerns, which Lambda handles. Uh, migrations is one of the big ones where like you've released version one, great. You don't need to work, worry about migrations at that point. 
But when you have version two and you've changed a bunch of things, because, you know, it's still early days, lots of new features and refactoring has happened. You now need to like take the old data and somehow migrate to new version. And with Lambda, it generates, it like saves your version one types and then can do a diff between version one and version two and see what has changed and then generate almost all of the migration for you. All you have to do is write the code for the bits that have changed, which typically isn't that much code. So it's a massive time saver. And on top of that, it's type safe. So where in, in like outside of Lambda, I'm always worrying like, am I about to do a deploy? And that's it. <laughs> Everything's yeah. gone. Uh, here I can be uh, much more like fast moving and not break things. And I think that's really nice. Move fast and not break things. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So evergreen migrations helped the, the ability to do serialization. Of course, the, when I say to do serialization automatically for you. So there's, you know, you don't have to think about that as even a concept. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, of course, the, the idea that your game logic is in one place. Yeah. Right? And yeah. you can reuse that in the front end and back end. Oh, there's one more thing I might add, uh, which is maybe for some people, this isn't a big deal. For me, I hate writing deploy scripts. So it's really nice in Lambda where you just write Lambda deploy in your command line and it just deploys. Like the first time you deploy, you need to like go to the Lambda dashboard and create the name of your app, but that's 20 seconds. Uh, in contrast, when I've worked like with AWS, I'm just like scratching my head, like, so what service do I need? How do I deploy mm -hmm. to it? And then there's, there's always that point where you have some kind of GitHub CI script and you run it, or, or rather you don't run it, you deploy, wait five minutes. Did it work? Oh no, it didn't. Okay, let me think for a while. What, what did I do wrong? Oh, typo there, try it again. Oh, I got a little farther. Five, you know, five minutes later, I find out I got a little farther. I got to figure out. Maybe some people are much better at that than I am, but hmm. I think that's my least favorite part is like the DevOps step. So I, yeah. I am so glad that Lambda takes care of that for me. Yeah, that's pretty great. I would say that you know there are entire roles, positions at, at companies where people work to handle the the DevOps. Uh, so. I think, uh, yeah, to be able to say, well, that's just, you know, that's not a concern for this is, is yeah. pretty amazing. So that is really cool. Um, I would want to mention, because you mentioned the serialization, you wrote a package for Elm, Elm Codec, that does some of this serialization type of thing. Was that something that you needed before you discovered Lambda or did it solve a different problem? That's before I discovered Lambda. Lambda actually made that work not so useful to me anymore. I, I sometimes use it. <laughs> but oh, oh, sorry, one minor correction. Uh, Elm Kodak is uh, Mini Bill's work. So oh, he was okay. the, the one who had the original idea um, to make like these functions you could build up that were both the encoder and decoder at the same time. Um, he had the original idea for that, though at the time I think he called them the type for it was not codec, it was called meta. Uh, I, I, I think I can claim credit for suggesting it be called codec instead. But otherwise, <laughs> all that work, like that stuff, uh, credit goes to him. And then for Elm Serialize, I decided to just, there were some parts of his package, which there was like, it was built with JSON in mind. And I wanted something that was built to be where the actual data being encoded was an implementation detail. So once you're no longer thinking in terms of JSON, you're just thinking in terms of data in some form, could be bytes, could be a string, whatever, you can simplify the API a bit. So that's where Elm Serialize comes from. So if, if you want to like think of a way of distinguishing the two, Elm Codec is you want to work with JSON and you sometimes want to work with well-behaved third-party APIs. Whereas Elm Serialize, it's like, no, you're just 100% working with your own data. It's your app that's encoding and decoding that then Elm serialize, I think is, uh, the, the, like the better choice. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is something I worked on um, and I, I used for a bit for like Circuit Breaker, for example, that game. Uh, well, for one, uh, when you when you beat levels, you know, you want to save the high score data and, and the fact that you unlock new levels. And then also you can change the colors of the levels. So all that data I wanted to be able to um, uh, serialize to like local storage, uh, local storage, because at the time I didn't have gotcha. Lambera. So everything was local storage or download it to your, fi to your uh, file system. But so I had Elm Serialize for, built for that. And then once Lambera came along, uh, Elm Serialize became not as relevant, though I still sometimes use it if I want to serialize something to local storage. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so were there any other... Were there any challenges that I mean, we've mainly talked about all of the the pros of this process, but were there any challenges that you found that, you know, trade-offs, if you will, uh, with doing it this way versus, um, you know, some of your other attempts or, you know, other tools that you used? Uh, are you referring to Elm Serialize versus Elm Codec or Lambda versus? Oh, sorry. I'm other. referring back to the Lego. I think the big challenge, and this is kind of, it, it wouldn't have mattered if I used Lambda or something else. The big challenge was performance. Like one of Elm's like big benefits is performance, but there's a bit of a caveat to that, which is that Elm is very fast when it comes to doing uh, like DOM rendering because it can very uh, efficiently figure out what has changed. You know, there's HTML.lazy, so you can uh, avoid doing redundant work. But when it comes to making games, you don't want to be working with HTML unless, unless it's a very simple game or it's like a turn-based game where you don't have, you know, you don't need to run something every animation frame. You just need to change what the user's looking at when they make an input. But for more real-time games, uh, WebGL is basically, like you can also try using SVG, but I think quickly you reach a limit where that's too slow. And then it's like WebGL is the the way forward, but even then, quickly you reach like a point where you, I'm just constantly thinking about, well, how can I make this faster? Because I like I don't want to generate lots of garbage that causes uh, garbage collector pauses in the game. Um, I don't want the game to like feel like it slows down when you're placing lots of houses quickly in a row. Uh, so there's lots of uh, caching that I need to do. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that, which I think overall it's a net positive. Like I lost time thinking about this performance stuff, but you know, I, I still gained a lot of time by the fact that it's Elm. You know, I'm not. <laughs> there's a whole whole <laughs> class of exceptions that I you know there's no null exceptions. I don't have to think about that. No time lost there. Uh, so overall, it's it's still good. But I'm always now thinking about like. Well, but but what what can we do to make this faster? One one thing I've always been thinking about: could we take uh, Elm optimized level two, um, which I, I don't know how well known that is within the community, but it's it's a tool that uh, I, I I apologize I don't remember the people who have been working on it, but it's something that some people have been working on, and it tries to take the output, the JavaScript that uh, the compiler generates, and do some tweaks to it to make it faster. So I've been thinking like, well, should I try out that? See what that does. It would be really cool if uh, Lambda Era had that built in, so that uh, all Lambda Era apps automatically get a perform performance boost from that. That's a good point. We've talked about Lambda Era quite a bit, and for folks who may not be familiar with Lambda Era, Lambda Era was created by Mario Rogic, and I I understand that you have you know kind of worked with him. Of course, we mentioned earlier the program test tool and the interactive UI source maps features that you built for Lambda. Maybe you could give us a, a little bit more detail about those and, and kind of your relationship there. Yeah. So I can start with uh Lambda program test, I believe. Yeah, that one came first. Um, I forget exactly what sparked the idea. It might've just been one of those, huh, I wonder if I could, yeah, that ought to work. I should try it. Specifically, Lambda Era program test swaps out all of the um, all of the like core functions. So, for example, 
you know, you can import it, the HTTP library and then do, you know, HTTP.get or HTTP.post. And Lambda Era program test swaps out those functions for another module called effect.http. But otherwise, the, the API is identical. And once you've swapped out all of these uh, effectful uh, modules, then what you can do is you don't need to change your program too much. You just need to like use effect dot mostly. But after that, you can write these tests where you simulate things happening. So for example, you simulate a, a front end, a, a user connecting to the back end, and then you can simulate them clicking on a particular button, maybe waiting a second or two, clicking another button, typing some text, something like that. And when I say simulate, I mean like a unit test. It's all synchronous. There's no actual spinning up a backend or spinning up a web browser. It's all done with an Elm code. You can simulate all of the HTTP requests, all the data sent from the backend, uh, specifically a Lambda era backend then, all the data sent from the front end to the Lambda era backend, all the data being sent back within this unit test. And by doing so, you can verify the app does what you expect it to do. Um, I, again, I'm not sure what caused me to start making this. I must have <laughs> just had a thought and like, yeah, I got to try this. But what I, yeah, what, what I figured out is like, wow, this, this can really pay off in certain situations. Like if you have an app with a, some kind of onboarding flow and then the user does, you know, fills out a form or whatever and then clicks the submit button and then they get maybe, maybe they get an email back or something. Um, all of these different steps and you want to somehow check that it works. Uh, when you can just write this uh, single unit test that simulates this entire flow, it saves it saves so much time when you're just, you know, you want to make a change and then you want to make sure nothing broke and you have to go through the happy path by yourself. So first I used this for uh, meet down. It was probably the first quote unquote real world test and it was promising there. So then I decided to use it at um, uh, uh, shortly after I started working at a startup called Realia. So I used it there um, and used it extensively because, yeah, it, it was really useful stuff. Um, one, one caveat to all this is that um, it does not work as well if you have uh, mm -hmm. JavaScript, if you have web components, for example, or if you have third-party APIs. This, this is why it's it's integrated with Lambda because now you know exactly what the backend looks like, so it can be integrated into this program test framework. Um, but but as soon as you have lots of other third party APIs that you have to uh, now you need to mock out. Um, now now you risk introducing bugs with your mocks and things become harder to work with. Um, this is you know this is kind of the reason I'm so into Elm because there's like a network effect where the more Elm you write, the better the existing Elm code becomes. Um, uh, before I ramble on too far, I should, I should credit, uh, AVH4 with making the original program test. So this idea was not purely from my mind. <laughs> I, I had uh, prior work that was part of the inspiration. His version, I believe instead of, um, where in a uh, Lambda program test, you have effect dot, you swap out all the modules with, um, th this effect dot version, his version instead, you... No, excuse me, you might still do that, but what you do instead of swapping it out completely is that you then write a effect function. So you have your own data type that represents all of the effectful things that can happen in your program. And as a final step, you take that, you have like a function that takes that effect type and converts it to actual commands and subscriptions. So that's, that's one distinction between the two. Oh, that, I guess that's where I can maybe claim some of my own ingenuity. Maybe <laughs> I'm sure someone else will tell me. No, no, I thought of that before you did, Martin. Yeah, <laughs> there, there's there's so much like just building upon other people's work. The program test uh, tool is is pretty mind boggling. You know, I think you you hit the nail on the head when you said that the more Elm that you use, the more you know benefits you gain at this. You know, it's exponential. It seems like, and it and I think it's it's really clear when you look at you know some of the the things that you've been able to build 
upon Elm. And then, you know, when you were able to uh, then get full stack Elm with Lamdera, then, you know, these other really incredible things um, that you were able to build. So I think, yeah, that is, that is truly a testament to, um, you know, the magnification of magnifying effect of this, um, of these uh, in intentional limits, if you will, you know, the constraints that, that Elm places that allow us to do all these really amazing things. So, yeah, um, I think, yeah, it, it is unique and it is, you know, definitely, um, building upon, like you said, Aaron Vonderhaar's, um, program test, but yeah, definitely taking it to new heights. So, uh, I guess standing on the shoulders of giants, if you will, but, but it's, it's really incredible. So yeah, thank you for building that. Um, yeah. And then, so the other one, interactive UI source maps for Lambda as well. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so again, I don't know where the idea came from. It's possible I had some inspiration and I've since plagiarized it by accident. Um, but the idea is, um, when you're now I'm going to talk in terms of Lambda, but this isn't actually Lambda specific, but the idea is when you're like working on a Lambda app and you have the UI in front of you that you can hit some hotkey, some kind of hotkey that shouldn't come up in practice. So it doesn't conflict with your actual app. But you hit some kind of hotkey, and a drop down will be produced over where your mouse pointer is. So whatever UI was underneath your mouse pointer, uh, it will show it will show a drop down that has a column of buttons, and each button, each button row, is a it's a line of code in your program that says like, okay, the first thing under your cursor is a like let's say it's a, a text input, so the line of code that creates that text input that's where the that's what the first button's for. If you click that button, then you're taken to the IDE with your cursor placed on that line of code, and then the the second button perhaps in this drop down is like the div containing the text input. So if you click on that, you go to the line of code that creates that HTML dot div, and so forth all the way to the div that contains your entire window. I admit this is one of those things where, so like I was just, you know, raving about oh, like Lambda program tests. So useful. I love it. With uh, the UI source mapping, I don't use it that much actually. <laughs> like <laughs> I, people have told me they like it. Uh, Mario, I think is the one who really loves it. Uh, but for me, it's like, well, I work with WebGL a lot. It doesn't work there. <laughs> it's not the same. You, you, you can't really do that with WebGL. Um, or, or I'm working with apps that they're not that complicated visually, so there's not as much to gain. Um, so, I mean, I think it's still cool. I, I, I'm glad that it works. It's one of those things that just says so much about Elm that you can have this idea and try it. And then in contrast to, I think, a lot of other languages where you would realize, oh, no, that just, this doesn't work in practice because there's escape patches and that causes it to conflict with this other code or this other thing people can use, or there's so many features in the language. This isn't going to work so nicely with some of them. And it's going to be a whole lot of work to make it work everywhere. In this case, it's just, you know, try it. Oh yeah, that worked. It works flawlessly really. (laughs) So like uh, in this case specifically, because you, when you create HTML, like uh, Elm's HTML package, the HTML you create cannot be modified. It cannot be introspected. So it's completely safe for uh, the compiler, the Lambda era compiler in this case, to sneak in some extra code that adds uh, attributes to your divs that says like, this div was created at this line number, which then when, the, when your web app is running locally, some, J- uh, some JavaScript code can read that attribute when you hit the certain special hotkey and create the dropdown for you. Um, where, yeah, this wouldn't be possible if, uh, if, uh, if the Elm compiler was more relaxed about restricting this sort of thing, if there was some more sort of escape hatch that lets you read the DOM structure within your Elm code, then this wouldn't work because suddenly adding arbitrary attributes could break someone's code. Yeah. My, my mantra for the year is there's freedom in your limits. And I think, you know, kind of going back to what. Uh, we talk about with the constraints that 
you know, they're artificial, right? Like obviously there are plenty of frameworks and, and tools that do things differently that take, you know, shortcuts that provide some, some benefit, but it, it's, it's pretty incredible how this particular set of constraints leads to so many things that, like you said, you just kind of try it and then you're like, Oh, okay. That was not too bad. That actually, wow. You know, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> But with this yeah. one in particular, if you, you said it relies on these, these lines being put into the source code, I'm guessing then you had to collaborate with Mario or did you learn some Haskell to do this or how did you approach this particular problem? Credit goes to Mario for helping me with this. Yeah, he was, he was completely open to the idea of just like, I had this idea, I proposed it to him. You know, we thought about it for a bit, like, could this work? Yeah, it's worth a shot. So I just went out and did it. Uh, he he showed me how to like you know set up the compiler to get it running on my machine, um, uh, specifically the Lambda era compiler. Uh, just get the Lambda era compiler running on my own machine. Uh, I had never written Haskell before, but it's pretty similar to Elm, so that really didn't take much time. And um, so because the Lambda era compiler is a fork of the Elm compiler, the, the code's pretty similar. So I think I should give Evan most credit with like. You wrote really readable Haskell code. Like, I've never written Haskell before. It was no problem to understand it. <laughs> so I just, like, nice. you know, navigated through the code. Like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. This is where I want to, like, insert these lines of code for generating attributes. And once I had it set up, it, like, it took a few hours, and then uh, the, the basic idea worked it just as, as a proof of concept. Um, from there, uh, Mario had to do a bit of legwork to, like, bring it up to, you know, compiler standards uh, and make it work uh, more nicely with the existing tooling and whatnot. Um, so uh, thank him for bringing it from, you know, my idea to production. But yeah, he, he was instrumental in helping me get this set up. Yeah, that's a, a nice collaboration then um, to hear about. And again, you know, kind of building on uh, the shoulders of giants. Thank you, Evan. Um, for building Elm. Yes, thank you, Evan. Uh, no, this would be possible without that. <laughs> um, so one of the things here that I found on the lambdera.com website is a quote. Uh, I think this quote is from you. Quote, the real cost of using Lambdera is that it makes me not want to put up with the infrastructure and tools we have at work, end quote. Yeah, uh, I think that's more of a warning. <laughs> it's on his marketing page, but I think that's a warning. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not yeah. a feeling I've had exclusive to Lambdera. I think the same thing happened when I learned Elm. Where like I learned Elm and now I don't I'm not really feeling motivated to work with C sharp anymore when I when I know there's better things out there. And then when I same deal start working with Lambdera, it's like I don't wanna write GitHub CI scripts anymore or you know, I don't want to <laughs> write all these encoders and decoders to do the basic communication between the front and the back end because I know there's better. Um, I don't know if other people work that way, but for me, it's like, yeah, if I know there's a better way, it, it's really, it really drains my motivation to do it the way it's always been done. I, I want to do it the best way. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I think it is um, sort of a a double-edged sword in a way because, yeah, if you are limited and you cannot kind of break out and, and do your own thing, then, um, you're going to feel a lot of demotivation. I, I certainly had that myself in 2018. I actually had, um, had agreed to be laid off, uh, with some other folks and then actually started searching for a job where I could use Elm when I, when I actually found the logistically job in, in January, 2019. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I know that powerful feeling and it, uh, it definitely motivated me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny now cause I, I talk to people with work and we use Python on the back end, and, you know, once they kind of get into Elm, then they're like talking about all these other things like for the back end, and we're far enough along that there's, you know, it's, it would be very difficult to change. It's probably not going to happen. Sorry folks. But, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reality of it is, you know, like, Hey, we get oh. to use Elm on the front end. So it's, it's it's wonderful, um, and then you know we just try to to b bridge that gap as much as possible. Um, but yeah, so anyway, that that is I guess the the kind of trade off. It's like once you go down the the rabbit hole and you get all these benefits, then you are 
aware when you don't get these benefits. And I think it's, you know, it's a huge productivity thing. It's, it's clear in the, a lot of the tools that you've been building. Uh, and we've only talked about a few of them. I mean, you briefly mentioned meat down, but maybe we should talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. And that's probably um, the first one that you had written, I would say as not game related, but to me, it, it seemed like it was the first one that kind of proved that we could build something that is an app, a web app, you know, that a company might build and you, you build it with Lambda and make it awesome. I think this is becoming a theme now, but I don't remember exactly why I built that. I think I think the reason is because Mario was hosting Elm London on meetup.com or meetups.com, whatever it's called. And they were charging him money for that. And I thought that's ridiculous. Why? Why are they charging money for that other than, you know, you know, it's a network effect. He's trapped on that uh, website. So they know they can make him pay money. But I thought that was dumb. So I decided to make my own version instead. Um, and, and yeah, I guess part of it was also, you know, see if Lambda was up to the task. Because it's so easy to like, you know, make the best color. It's like 100 lines of code and declare, oh, Lambda is great. And then <laughs> not realize that when you reach the thousand line code mark or the 10,000 line code mark, you know, something breaks, who knows what. So I wanted to like push the limits. At least I'm assuming, you know, I, again, I should have written it down. I don't remember exactly why I made it down. <laughs> but yeah, so I decided to do that. And I think, I think it just took me a week or two. I, I happened to have some vacation time or something. And over that time period, I just made meat down. Um, and it, it went really smoothly. So at that point, I think Mario was my first user. Uh, I, I, I should add that another reason he switched is because uh, he wasn't really getting a a benefit from the network effect of having lots of users on meetup meetups.com because he was he was uh people were finding out about his events because he was like promoting it on twitter and slack so he like there was no sense in him staying around on meetups.com so yeah he switched over um and he's using meet down for uh a group called elm online which is another group that runs every month or so or bi-monthly um, that, that people are welcome to join, by the way, it's a great group. We present lightning talks, <laughs> um, but yeah. And then, and then over the uh, past year or two, various other people have started using it. I think, yeah, rock, uh, rock online is also part of it, uh, which I don't know. It makes me really happy to see that like, Oh, <laughs> a whole different group is trying it out. It's not just Elm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, there is some overlap, of course. But, oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, Richard Feldman, where's, what's he been doing before rock? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that is, that is really neat. Um, and so, yeah, you, you built this and, and, you know, seemingly we're, we're thinking maybe partly motivated by Mario's comments about uh, the cost of, of meet up. And I think it's, it's a great tool. Again, you're using the email link to log in tactic, which I think works really well. The next thing that I wanted to get into, if you didn't have anything else on that particular topic was to talk about using Lambda professionally. You posted about this on discourse and your participation in, I think it was about a year and a half, you worked part-time at a real estate startup. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so one and a half years and my last day there was about three months ago. So we'll say I started about two years ago at this point. Um, yeah. So after I had finished my previous job, which was uh, Elm on the front end and F Sharp, but at that point, I wanted to use Lambda. Again, th this warning I mentioned earlier applies. I, <laughs> I couldn't stand <laughs> F sharp for the back end anymore, so I had to find a new job. But so I reached out to some friends, like just people I knew who might know other people who might need a programmer. And specifically, I was looking for like a, a greenfield project because I wanted to bring in Lambda. And my best odds of doing that was if there was no existing code base. 
Um, so uh, one of my ex colleagues actually knew a person who was yeah looking for a programmer and wanted to create this app that would help people uh, who were selling their homes in Sweden find realtors. Um, so uh, I met him for lunch and we chatted and I, I showed him like ASCII Collab, for example. He was looking for an Elm programmer already and I tried to help upsell him to, okay, but uh, how about the Slamdera thing? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think he was a bit, of, a bit of like on the edge, like, well, okay, you seem very enthusiastic about this and I do want an Elm programmer. Um, I think what sold him on it was just, well, for one thing, this was like, uh, we, we could do like an MVP with it. And after that, if we changed our minds, we could switch. And the other thing is that um, I offered to work like a week or two for free as a proof of concept real quick. Just like, okay, I'll just take your existing thing because he had this little app and some UI uh, sketches. And what, I'll just take what you have there and I'll write it up in Lambda real quick. Just It took me like a week and a half or something. Um, just, just to prove a point about it didn't take much effort to do things in Lambda. And I think at that point, he was like, okay, fine. <laughs> You've convinced me. So, uh, yeah, I, I started working there. Uh, as you mentioned, it, it was part-time, so just 20 hours a week. Um, so I, I still had a lot of free time, which was nice. Uh, I, m maybe some people don't like part-time work because, you know, it also means part-time salary. But uh, for me, it was like, oh, all this free time. I can do all this other stuff while I'm at it. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed the work there. Um, the, the, the one downer, the reason I don't work there anymore is that, um, we couldn't find any customers, unfortunately. Um, we never were really able to figure out what we were doing wrong. Was there no market? Were we just marketing badly? Maybe it was something wrong with the tech. Like the, the nightmare scenario I had was like, oh, we, we have lots of customers, but they can't get past the homepage, you know, or there's some bug or like, it seems very unlikely because I was using program tests, like the happy path was tested like crazy. So I, I felt confident, but but still like some worry that like something like that was happening. In the end, we don't know. Um, it just, we never really got any customers. Uh, well, okay, we got one customer. I think we had one legit customer and we got one customer who actually was just confused and thought you could buy homes with our app. And so, so when they told us that, we're like, oh man, dang it, almost. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but otherwise, it was, uh, I really enjoyed my time there. I, I enjoyed my colleagues. And of course, I liked using Lambert professionally. That was, that was really cool. Yeah, it sounds like you were really motivated, you know, giving away your time for a couple of weeks in order to create this proof of concept and prove this point. Um, in order to do this. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, that was like, you were living the dream at that point, right? You were uh, writing Lambda professionally and still had time to work on side projects. Yeah. Yeah. So then you were writing this app with full stack Elm at that point, right? You're using Lambda. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I saw that came out of that is uh, Elm map. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? That's a, uh, a net gain, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's uh, so many things happen that I like forget the the, the, the big things. They somehow slip past me. <laughs> yeah, L Map was so in the beginning we used Google Maps for for this uh, Realia uh, app we had created. Um, Google Google Apps is not it's it's hard to integrate into an L Map. So we stopped using Google Maps and we switched to Mapbox, which was an improvement, but I still wasn't satisfied with it. Um, long term, I wanted to switch to something that was pure Elm. Uh, I had already like over uh, over a winter break done a proof of concept where I just wanted to like verify that like it was possible to take the vector tile format that Mapbox provides from its servers and decode it so that uh, it can be used within a hypothetical Elm like pure Elm map viewer. Um, so after I had that set up, then I just needed to, you know, get permission from my boss to do that. Um, it, it took a little while. I had to like, you know, <laughs> can, can I do it now? No, there's more important features. Fine, you're right. Okay, uh, a couple weeks later, how about now? No, still no, we should, re we should redo the UI first. Like, okay, fine. <laughs> but eventually, <laughs> eventually uh, I, I got permission to do it. Um, I think it took like, 
I mean, I wasn't timing it, so it's hard to say with precision, but two, three months to do. And this was working part time. So maybe if it was full time, closer to half that. But uh, yeah, I managed to make a pure Elm map box viewer. Um, and as a bonus, then I asked my boss, hey, can we open source this? And he was like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's open source. Um, and oh, actually, um, again, I apologize. I don't remember their name. But but someone immediately after I announced that this uh, L map was open source, they used it to display. It, it looked, they had like some kind of 3D data that they would place on top of the map. So as, as a guess, maybe they were like, visualizing a glide path for like a for a uh for an airplane or something uh so they placed that on top of the map and they actually added a 3d effect to it which i thought was really cool because uh l map was not built to do that but because it's um l map is rendered using webgl it's it's all even if it's a 2d perspective it's within a say 3d context so it's not that difficult to lean the camera to the side um, to get a 3d perspective. Um, Very nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I looked that up. That was the app was GPX magic. And yes, yes. the person who posted that is Peter James Ward. I thought that was pretty incredible. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you, Martin. And thank you, uh, <laughs> to the, uh, the person that started the startup uh, with Sam, you too, Sam for, yeah for open allowing that to be open source. So yeah, yeah. Um, really cool. Now, are you using WebGL, the the package that Andre Kuzman uh, has worked on or is that lower level WebGL? Uh, it's WebGL the lesson. package that, yeah, it's the, the Elm Explorations uh, WebGL package. Um, uh, the, the reason I use it is because it gives a sufficiently low level that you get a lot of the performance benefits from WebGL and a lot of the flexibility that WebGL provides uh, in contrast to something like SVG. Um, but in contrast to doing WebGL directly with just, just directly with browser APIs, uh, the WebGL package, it's, well, like Elm, right? It's hard to mess things up. It, it guides you so that things tend to just work. Um, and so uh, this is speaking as someone who has done OpenGL before. So OpenGL is basically WebGL, but meant for your desktop instead. In, and it's a WebGL is a bit more constrained because when they made it, they wanted that it was going to also work on uh, low power devices like phones. So WebGL is a bit more constrained. But I've worked with OpenGL before, and my experience with that is that you like you follow to you follow a tutorial like to the letter for every step. You need to compile a shader program. You need to load it. You need to load a buffer with vertices and attributes. You need to make sure that adds up in the right spot. You got to load everything together in the right order. And if you do anything wrong, blank screen, no indication why. Um, so like, I was. I was well aware of how bad it could be. And the WebGL package is just, well, I, I don't know how to like, I don't know any fancy words to really capture what I felt, but it was really easy to use. It was really stable. Um, now, I should clarify, there is some flexibility you, you lose. Like uh, you can't like unload a mesh or unload a texture or unload a shader the way you can when you're writing shader API calls directly. Uh, and this is actually a concern in some cases. So for like Town Collab, uh, right now, if you play the game for like an hour straight, which I don't think many people do, but if you do that, the game will freeze up because you run out of GPU memory. So that's something I need to address. Uh, so there, it's it's not all perfect, but it's, my goodness, like so much time lost working with OpenGL. Like, okay, I follow the tutorial. Why isn't it working? Oh, that step. I did something a little bit wrong there. Nothing shows up on the screen. Got to fix that. Um, I don't want to go back to those days. <laughs> so thank you, Audre. Thank you so much for putting that package together. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great testament to it. And I worked with Andre on a, a 3D pool game at one point, and I didn't have to do a lot of that 
part of the the project. I was mostly working with the the logic of the game of you know what happens when this ball hits this other ball and you know what's the the rules regarding that. Um, so it was you know kind of separated in that way. But the part that I did interact with that and and when I was playing around with this before I uh, worked with Andre, I w- just played around with Elm. 3D scene by Ian McKenzie, which is built on top of Elm yeah. uh, WebGL. And so, I mean, that was just like, that was such a dream, uh, you yeah. know, and, and I didn't, had no idea, you know, no experience, prior experience with any of it. And the fact that I was able to like get things working on the screen was amazing. I was even able to build this tool at work that visualizes how pallets and, and containers are placed inside of a semi truck trailer. So, um, and we, we use that at work and that, I mean, it's a huge, um, thing that, that we always tout because visually it's, it's really, uh, nice to see that and, and get that feedback. Originally I just did it because I was trying to figure out a bug with the original program. And so I rewrote the whole thing in Elm, um, (laughs) in order to, (laughs) as you do, as as you do. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And it really, yeah, again, kind of what you're saying, like you just start and you try a little bit and you're like, okay, this is going all right. This is going all right. And then you're done. You're like, wow, that, that really wasn't that bad. I'm like, I just did this thing that to me would have seemed impossible any other way. Um, And, and it, it it turned out great. So yeah, thank you to Ian. Thank you to Andre uh, for those tools. Um, Yeah. So at Realia, what, was the team size there? Uh, we were a team of three people. So me included, me and two other people. Um, I was, so I was the programmer on like the front end and sort of the back end because we had the Lambda era back end. But my boss, uh, Sam, he wrote a small Python script and also set up a database. So the architecture was something along the lines of you know, your front end requests to the Lambda back end for realtors, like a list of realtors to show on the map. And then the Lambda back end would ask the Python script, which would ask the database. Um, and it worked, it worked fine. You know, like you might guess this, but I'm not a big fan of Python, but I didn't, it wasn't much Python code. The Python code worked fine because, you know, it, it, there wasn't that much of it. It was pretty simple and straightforward. Um, so yeah, all that went smoothly. Oh, and then my boss also, um, to populate the, the database with real letter information, he wrote up a, a web scraping script so he could uh, collect, because there's a bunch of uh, realtor, there's a bunch of different realtor companies in Sweden that have listings of what realtors work for them and the houses they've sold. So we collected that data so we could have something to present on our website. Um, so we, we, we essentially were the two programmers and then the third person, uh, Sina was like our UI designer and he also worked as a, a bit of a businessman. Both Sam and him were the businessmen. The, they were uh, co-founders together, but Sina's other responsibility was doing UI design. Um, so he, he would, uh, put together stuff in Figma and then I would be responsible for implementing it. Uh, a, a bit of a tangent here, but, uh, because he was using Figma, uh, and Figma supports writing plugins in JavaScript, I wrote a Elm, like platform.worker Elm app that would compile to JavaScript so I could run it as a plugin in Figma. And what it would do is it would take the, like if I click on part of the UI, it would try to convert that into Elm UI code. Um, so it, it would save me some typing. Um, Unlike the other stuff we talked about here, this felt more of on the edge of like, oh, is this really save me time? Maybe because the the code it generated wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't quite where it would need to be to really be useful. But uh, I, I thought it was pretty cool to have, like, to be able to just make something like that. Uh, just kind of, I, I suppose it's it's sort of an unintended benefit of JavaScript being everywhere. Is that well, it means Elm is everywhere too. <laughs> you can try it wherever you think it might work yeah yeah okay so a, a team of three working on this you were working half time how many mm-hmm. lines of code for the 
Lamdera Elm side of it. Uh, so I actually counted this at some point, and now I don't quite remember the numbers, so I'm afraid if I say a number now and check later, I'll realize they don't match up. <laughs> but I'm going to guess, I think it was about 30,000 lines of code. Um, specifically with the caveat that, like, I think we had a module that was like test data, but it, it was not in the test folder because it was easier to structure having it in source folder. So not counting that, for example, um, I think it was like 30,000 lines of code, which to me is kind of like, that's it. Like, <laughs> really, this entire app and it's 30,000 lines of code. But I, I think just nor in a normal app, there is so many lines of code that just go to uh, what, what Mario refers to as glue code, where it's just writing the encoders and decoders, writing the HTTP requests, all that sort of stuff um, that you don't need to do in Lambda era. Um, and that, that, that just renew, reduces a, like the amount of boilerplate you have to write is so much less, but, but maybe I should go check that number and we'll put something in the show notes if I'm wrong, just, just so I'm not like spreading misinformation here. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. So yeah, you're guessing around 30,000 lines of Elm code for front end and back end. And this would include whatever serialization, deserialization you needed to do with the the realtor data, correct? That you were connecting to? Yes, yes. So because that's third-party data, uh, we needed to have decoders for that. It wasn't that much decoding. The, the format wasn't that complicated. Um, you know, this is an advantage of being able to speak to the person who's writing, you know, who's creating <laughs> the data. Um, but but this line of code count, it does include like the entire map viewer. Oh, wow. That yeah. just, yeah, even that wasn't that many lines of code. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that's that's pretty incredible. Is there anything else that you've been working on that you want to talk about? Um. Yeah, so, well, so I have been working on a project with Mario. Uh, I think I'm allowed to talk about it because he's talked about it during Elm Camp. <laughs> yeah, ooh, juicy gossip. <laughs> um, yeah, we've had the idea of, uh, we want to make a website called Elm Market. The idea, at least for the initial version of it, being something where you can create feature bounties. So if you think like bug bounties, uh, a person creates bug bounties. They pay you when you find and report bugs to them. The idea with a feature bounty is you place money on a particular feature you want to see completed, and then the person who uh, decides to complete that feature uh, gets the bounty. Um, and so that's what we something we want to try. So basically, uh, it, it rewards people for being like the the good Samaritan who goes around fixing bugs in the Elm ecosystem. Hmm. Um, so that's something we want to try out. Uh, but yeah, that's lots of details to work out. Um, so probably should leave it at that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I have a ton of questions, but I'll I'll reserve them for when you uh, are might want to like reach out to Mario, chat with him. It's it's uh, credit to him. I think. Yeah, this is mostly his idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw some conversation about this at at one point in one of the discords. I don't remember which one, but um, yeah, yeah, it kind of seemed like it was one of those things where a lot of it seems like the the collaborations you've had and the projects you all worked on, it's like you kind of joke about it for a little bit and then it becomes a little more like, well, you know, that could be yeah. a real thing, you know? And uh, that's great. I think that's, well, that's the way okay. it should so be. I, it I like can add fun. a little bit more. I can add a little bit more. Um, so there, th this is not a totally new idea. I checked online. There's other websites that do feature bounties, but as far as I can tell, they're all, you know, dead. There's nothing going on there. Um, and I have a theory why. Um, I think if you're doing a feature bounty service for everything, like all possible re GitHub or GitLab or you know all, all the other Git repos out there, the problem you arrive at is that a lot of code, it takes a lot of time for someone new to just step in and figure out what's going on before they can even begin solving someone's feature bounty. But I don't think that's the case in Elm, at least not in my experience. Like total strangers can just go, yeah, that issue right there, I can fix that. You know, I've got like a weekend that I don't have anything planned. And they can just step in and do it. And because Elm is, you know, 
as as you know, probably preaching to the choir here, it's like it's so easy to understand Elm code. Um, it's so easy to just just dive into someone else's work, um, with exceptions. Uh, Mario actually during Elm Camp ran a session <laughs> called uh, something along the lines of the worst Elm code possible, where we had to think <laughs> up how to write the worst Elm code possible. So you know, there's pathological cases where this is not true, but. Yeah, I, I think in the case where like where you have a GitHub issue that is some kind of you know self-contained feature or or maybe a bug even that you want fixed, uh, in those sorts of situations, I think Elm's a really good fit for this idea because someone can just easily step in, do the work without too much fuss, um, and I think yeah, I think that sort of thing should be rewarded. So, well, we'll see what happens. You know, hopefully it works out. Yeah, well, that's exciting. We'll uh, be listening and hoping for more details to come soon. Um, what about uh, State of Elm? You did that last year. Is that something you think? Oh, oh you know? no. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Yeah, last year. Um, specifically, I did it last year. I think it was like April, maybe late March. And uh, it's this year. It's a few months past those months. What happened, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, what happened is, I don't know, just kind of felt unmotivated to work on it. And actually, like the two days before this podcast, I was thinking, oh, I should really like wrap that up so I don't have to say this during the podcast. <laughs> um, but it's not ready yet. Um, so now my next, like, my next, like, last, like, Hail Mary is, okay, well, I can finish it before this podcast goes live. So when people hear me saying this, well, they'll, they'll know that it's already out at least. And so... I will be redeemed. But yeah, it just, I know, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes you feel motivated to work on something and sometimes you don't. And it's hard to control why. It's just, yeah. 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 I totally get it. Which, that. you know, it sucks because some part of me does want to work on it. It's just not the part in charge of the fingers, I guess. So I can't <laughs> type the code out. Um, but yeah, um, I'm hoping to have that finished before this podcast episode goes live. Um, and hopefully, if there's any statisticians out there who are actually hoping to use the state of Elm data to draw some sort of like inference, um, hopefully the fact that the first state of Elm and the second are like a year and a half apart, hopefully that doesn't mess with any like <laughs> conclusions you're trying to make. I'm sorry. Otherwise I should, yeah, I should have had it done earlier, but yeah. I'll have it done soon. Well, no pressure. I I appreciate that you did it, you know, the the one time. So we'll take what we can get. Um but yeah, I uh, I think it will be interesting if, you know, if that does get out there to see, you know, how it's has changed. It's just neat, you know, from a again, not having to do the the work. It, it it's nice for me to say that, but you know, <laughs> um just to be able to look at that information and and get something that is again targeted to what we work on. I do the state of JS survey every year and it ends up being just I don't know that feature, I don't know this feature for JavaScript. I don't know that. I've never heard of this library. No, 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 no. Enter in Elm. Yes, you know, yes, yes. <laughs> Elm Elm <laughs> into all the free text places I can get. And then yeah. if there's not a free text, I, you know, I get frustrated and then, you know, just move on to the next question. And, <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, it's nice to have something that is um, targeted for, for us. So, uh, don't forget, you need to enter an Elm radio and Elm podcast in the, uh, the section that involves like news and podcasts. That's the other yes. thing you got to do. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so I'm guessing if you are thinking about this for this year, Will you be putting the podcast on there as, as you know, do people listen to the podcasts or about Elm Camp, anything like that? Sorry, putting, that far? Uh, putting those questions on the state of Elm survey. Will you be, will you be doing that for this year? Do you think, have you thought about that? Um, probably nothing with Elm Camp. Um, right now the issue is I just, you know, I just want to get it released um, it, towards like, the start of this year, there was discussion around like, well, what questions should we add? You know, people had lots of good ideas and, you know, yeah, don't make 
perfect the enemy of good, right? Like, I, I just need to get it released. There are some questions I've added. Um, uh, one of the big ones that I really do want to add is collecting information about what packages people use. So mm -hmm. uh, specifically, I have a question where you upload an Elm JSON for your application or, or several applications, and it, it extracts all the packages, all the uh, dependencies you have. Uh, I think that could be really useful information to tell people like what packages are like heavily depended on or like what version of those packages is heavily dependent on um, and see if there's any trends, especially going forward. Like if, if a new package comes out, it'd be cool to see what kind of like how how quickly a new package gets adopted or, you know, how much churn there is in dependencies, like assuming um, State of Elm, you know, goes for several years. That would be interesting information to collect. Um, but yeah, I, I've been mostly focusing on just trying to get it out. Um, Fair enough. And yeah. perhaps this is unpopular, but I've also been like thinking about what questions I should remove because at the end of the day, once the surveys are in, I got also sort the data. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, now with uh, GPT being a thing, uh, it might be feasible to just give it a you know big blob of free text answers and go you sort it figure it out <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and, perfect you know, hopefully case. it'll come up with something good yeah um, but I, I still want to hedge my bets there and I think some of the other questions some of the questions just didn't really make sense to keep um, so yeah not all the questions are there from last year but I've tried to you know I don't want there to be too much churn with the questions because it's hard to do any kind of you know analysis over a long period of time if the questions are different every year. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking like, I'm going to add the Elm JSON question and then maybe next year there'll be more advice and I will feel more motivated to include those questions that people suggest. But then maybe after that, there'll be some kind of like, for the most part, just locking off, this is it. These are the questions we're going to ask so that we can get, you know, it's kind of like Elm, right? It doesn't change too quickly. And to some part, that's a downside. But to another extent, that's a benefit because everyone knows what they can expect. It's something that can be relied upon. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And I think it goes even further with what you're talking about with removing questions that don't make sense. You know, that's definitely something that, that happens in the Elm ecosystem and the language of removing things that don't make sense or they're, you know, they're causing more harm than, than good. So, yeah, I think... Uh, and again, you're the one doing it. So if you feel motivated uh, to do it and that helps, then I say go for it. All right. <laughs> All right. So is there anything else you want to talk about before we move on to picks? Um, well, I'm looking at the timer. I think based on the current time, I'm going to say no. Okay. <laughs> Save something for the next episode, perhaps. There we go. All right. That sounds good. Well, Martin, what picks do you have for us today? So something that's come up recently, uh, Mini Bill has been working on a, well, I don't know if it's the final yay. I don't know if it's the final name yet, but it's a package called Elm Interpreter, uh, which to me kind of came out of nowhere, but it's really cool. And, and basically it's taking your Elm code, parsing it with uh, the Elm syntax package, and then just running it. So it skips the type checking step. Um, so this is a dis this is what distinguishes it from like Elm and Elm, for example, which tries to be a uh, full-on compiler. But thanks to skipping that step, it also is much easier to implement. So Minibel has been able to have like uh, an Elm interpreter put together in uh, a few weeks' time that I think is really cool. And I think it's also really cool that um, uh, Jim, JXX Carlson, as he's referred to on Slack, I believe, uh, was able to immediately use it to put together a uh, uh, like a Jupyter notebook style application. Um, so cool to see Elm Interpreter and really cool to see someone immediately like build upon it, use it for their own application. Yeah, totally. That's a really cool one. I forgot about that, but now that you mentioned it, that, that wasn't that long ago that um, the Elm notebook came out by Jim. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. Yeah. And yeah, that of course builds on many bills. Elm Interpreter. Really neat. Okay. What else? I guess I should just give shout outs. Uh, my sister's girlfriend was the one who set up this microphone, the web camera, everything. And uh, I think 
well, I'll have to confirm it when I'm listening to this podcast later, but I think I sound much better than I would otherwise sound. So shout outs to her. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And what's her up, name? Jenny. Uh, Jenny. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jenny. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Okay. Any other shout outs? No, uh, may, I'm feeling like man, maybe I should have thought of something more. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got those two, unfortunately. No, that's great. All right. Well, for me, my picks, uh, they're pretty straightforward. One is the Lamdera docs. Yeah, the, I think it's the main page where it shows the lack of glue code in those diagrams. I think those pictures are worth a thousand words and obviously yeah, they're worth I agree. a thousand packages by <laughs> Martin Stewart here um, because he's been able to build some really amazing things with Lambda and with Elm. So yeah, check that out if you have not. And then the other one, I thought about it while we were doing this podcast, you mentioned Elm online meeting on Meetdown, and it's on meetdown.app. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but definitely if you are into Elm, go to that. A lot of the things that Martin's been talking about, they're mind blowing. And I got to get them more incrementally because he would present on them at the Elm online meeting. And so, um, that was really exciting. Um, so yeah, if your mind is blown right now and you want more of that, probably go check that out. Um, and thanks to all the folks listening out there. So please rate and share if you're enjoying the show. And thanks, Martin, for coming to Elm Town. Uh, hey, though. Sorry, I do have one more pick. This might be a little pandering, but thank you for hosting Elm Town again. I'm so glad to be back. It's been a while. Oh, you're welcome. Anyway, you're very yeah. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. Of course. All right. Well, hey, though. Bye.